Stanford University. Hi, <clears throat> let me introduce my colleague, Dave Evans. Dave Evans is the co-director of the D-Life Lab here at Stanford. He's been teaching Designing Your Life with me for seven years. And this is my colleague, Bill Burnett, the executive director of the design program at Stanford. He's been here 25 years teaching people how to do design. And we're joining forces today to do open office hours with you. And probably the questions we hear the most often is, I don't know what my passion is. You know, can you help me find my passion? So then I know what to do next. And um, the answer is, we don't think it's a great question. Yeah, the research says that maybe only two or three out of 10 people actually have a passion that they've identified that they can work into. We believe that actually passion turns out to be what you develop after you find the things that you enjoy doing. So if you start with the passion question, seven out of 10 people are going to just have nowhere to go. So we don't like that question. Mm -hmm. If you got qu one, that's great. If you got a passion, that's great. But you know, most people don't. And it's not a prerequisite. The other question we get asked a lot, particularly here on campus, someone says, hey, I'm going to major in English or I'm going to major in comparative, you know, religious studies. And the next thing that they hear, typically from a parent or an adult is, so what are you going to do with that? As if your major decided who you would be for the rest of your life. So these are two what we call dysfunctional beliefs. Yeah. And once you get rid of both of those, that your major is linked to your job and that your passion is somehow yeah, an innate you know, quality. Um, once, you, once you realize neither of those things are actually true, you're really free to use design thinking to start designing the life you want to have. So Dave, we have a question from Julia um, who wants to know if we have any advice for an aspiring generalist. Advi we, you know, probably. First of all, there's the issue of advice. Do we give advice or do we give counsel? And we make a distinction there, by the way, which is, you know, remember, counsel is when we help you figure out what you're thinking. And advice is when we tell you what we think. Right. And they're very different. Right. She's asked for advice. We'll try to be helpful. We prefer counsel, by the way. But since we, Julie's not here, we'll try to think up some things that might be helpful. Um, general, if someone says I'm an aspiring generalist, I hear two things there. And they might be pretty different. I really want to be, a, I want to be doing lots of things at the same time. I want to live a life that's not particularly rooted in one narrow lane. Right. That's one version. Right. Or there's a person who has lots of interests and really doesn't know where to start. They're willing to focus in on something, but it, it's not presenting itself yet. Which of these varieties of ways should I yeah. go? And I'm yeah. kind of stuck. Right. Those are different problems. Let's take the second one, because that comes up a lot. Yeah, if you're in the situation where um, there's lots and lots of things you're excited and interested about, but you can't pick one, um, our advice, again, is mm -hmm. to start where you're at. Um, there will be one or two things that maybe have a slightly different emotional energy in them than, than the, other ones. the other ones. So you go find somebody who does something like that. You look at the future you. Right. Someone is already living the you you might become. Right. And you go talk to them. This is a place, again, where the design thinking really, really impacts reality. We kind of go with prototype iteration, try stuff, see what works. Bias to action. Bias to action. And here are all these ideas I have. I'm interested in marketing. I'm interested in social innovation. I'm interested in working on organic farms. Really <laughs> different things. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, gosh, gosh, no, Dave and Bill, I really don't have an emotional preference. Mm -hmm. I'm truly stuck. Right. Well, wait a minute. You're assuming the priority is I need to really like one more than the other. Right. There are lots of other starting places. What's more accessible? What's in a geography I find is interesting? Where's where one of my friends might be? Right. So you could just go with availability. Who do I know? Well, I happen to know somebody working on an organic farm. Fine, go talk to them. Yeah. Start there. Start there. Start where you have access to. It really doesn't matter. But get going into the conversation, yeah. and things will start happening. So there's two things we just talked, we just did in the design thinking framework. One is bias to action. Right. Don't try to decide your way forward. Just do something. Right. And design then your way forward. Design your way forward. And the second is reframe. Reframe the problem from, gee, I can't figure out which one of these is my, my most favorite. Right. To all of these are good. I'm going to, I'm just going to start doing them. Right. So if I'm a generalist with equal interest, I'm in a much more powerful position because I have lots of available starting places to begin to understand what it is I really want to do, yeah. as opposed to, I can't possibly choose. You're not choosing yet, you're just starting. Yeah, which is a really powerful reframe. In the old position, since I can't choose, I can't start. Right. I have no power. In the reframed position, 
I'm mm -hmm. in a better situation than a specialist. Which is the design point of view. You know you don't know the answer. Many people in this vocational wayfinding, as we call it, think you have to know the answer at the beginning and then you implement. And you're screwed, right. is the technical but term. <laughs> but what it really means is, I just know what I know, take the next step, it yeah. will be revealed as you go. April, was a chemistry major thinking of maybe doing a, a pre-veterinarian uh, track, okay. but just decided... So she's clear, she's on path. Then she's changed her mind and has decided that she wants to go maybe into marketing. She's also a vegan. So how does a mm -hmm. chemistry major who's a vegan get a job in marketing, Dave? And is it too late to change? Yeah, is, is it, it too, too late, late to change? To change? Um, no, it's not too late to change. First of all, you know, you can redirect your intention of the... Ma There's no reason to drop the chemistry major. I mean, a chemistry major can absolutely have a marketing career. Yeah. Um, I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in thermo sciences, which I spent about five minutes using, and 35 years doing marketing. So trust me, you can do it. Um, but how would she get there? Um, so the short answer is yes. Then the real issue is how do I start down this other path? Right. So how do I do that? Well, you start with accept. I've changed my mind. I'm no longer going to go to vet school. And oftentimes we find that actually making that decision is a very freeing point in this process. And the next thing you do is you go start having what we call informational interviews with people who are marketing products in organizations you might want to work in. Right. So let's say I'm a, I'm a vegan. What do I even begin? Well, begin with what's interesting. Everybody is interested in something. Right. So you think, what are the products you think are kind of interesting in the world? What companies are making those sort of things? And find your way to get to people in those organizations and say, gee, how did you guys come up with these products? What are you doing? What's on your mind? You get conversations, again, information interviews, not looking for a job. You're just looking for the story. And everybody's got a story. So that conversation is easy to get. Right. The jobs are hard to get. You don't want to look like I'm looking for a job. I don't need a job. I just need your story. And what's it like working in this, you know, animal-friendly cosmetics product company? Right, right. Um, so we had a question from Daniel who asks, what should I be when I grow up? Uh, actually, the cheap answer is older, um, <laughs> you know, and, but older and Daniel. So, uh, but we have some thoughts on that. You know, and, and um, this isn't just a, this isn't a college question. We hear this from 30-somethings, from 40-somethings, from 50-somethings. Yeah. When we yeah. did a talk to the Parents Advisory Council, they all said, yeah. oh, I'm still mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, who I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, our short answer, what do you guys do for a living? We teach classes on helping people figure out what they want to be when they grow up. And everybody, including the dean of the School of Engineering, said, oh, can I take the class? Yeah. So everybody's got Daniel's question. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty common question. And it's, again, it's one of those things where we'd like to sort of reframe the answer because you can't know ultimately who you will become when you, quote, grow up. Right. But you can know. And by the way, that's the good news. Yeah. Do, you, do you really want to be able to know at 22 who your 60-year-old self should be? I mean, do you really want this 22-year-old running the next 50 years of your life? We hope to find out things we couldn't possibly have imagined. Yeah. So but, I, I don't want to be able to know that answer, do I? No, it's the, the design perspective is when I'm starting a new design, I don't actually know the answer. I'm going to design into that possible future. So we reframe the question not as what do you want me to be when I grow up. It's like, wh where am I right now? And what is the next step I can take to move towards the best possible version of me? Right. right? And we frame that with language. So the, the way the question is usually posed, it assumes you could navigate to where you should be. Right. Do you know the end point? And I know how to get to Fresno, so I just GPS myself to Fresno. Yeah. But we can't, because I don't know where I'm going, so what I, I can't navigate, so I have to wayfind. What's wayfinding? It's, it's moving from where you are to the next available place that you can make a decision about. It's the same thing mm -hmm. as the generalist deciding, hey, what's available to me? Right. So the, the real answer to Daniel's question is, um, what's the next best step for me to take that will have a more likely outcome that in the long run, I will say I grew into the Daniel I wanted to be. Right. That's the better question. And, and, and that first step is leaning into the invitation in front of you that looks most life-giving, that looks most interesting and energizing, and by the way, is available in real time, in real space, and, and is accessible. And as you're moving towards that best possible Daniel, you're increasing what we call coherence, right? Right. Talk about coherence. So by coherence, we mean um, you know, who am I, what do I believe, and what am I doing? If, if I understand what those things are, what, what do I think about life and who I am, you know, what I'm actually doing and where I'm trying to go, if I can describe those things articulately mm -hmm. and, and interconnect the dots, 
not that they're perfect, but even understanding where the compromises are, I'm living coherently. I mean, who I am, what I'm doing, all lines up for me. Right, right. That's the coherent life. And even positive psychology research demonstrates pretty clearly if I can articulate what those things are, who I am, what I believe, and what I'm doing, and I can understand the interrelationship between them, my yeah. chance of feeling good about my life and, and that it's a meaningful experience is much higher. Right. So, uh, so Sylvan um, asked us the question, like, I'm, I'm a 57-year-old you know, working musician currently studying psychology. Got any tips for the next 25 years of my life? Well, you know, we, we do a thing in, in our class where we talk to college students, and all the college students we talk to, when they got into college, people said to them, Oh, Dave, these, the college are going to be the best years, the best of, your, years, best of, your years of your life. So that implies that at 57, he's already had his best years. Yeah, you're 30 years past. Yeah. By the time you're 22, you're on the downhill slide, so, which is a terrifyingly right. bad idea. So what do you think about that? Well, I think the whole idea is that it does want to move onward and upward. And first of all, kudos to Sylvan for even asking the question, ideas about the next 25 years of my life. So he's not just trying to get through. He's trying to keep thriving and flourishing. Right. Um, and so thing one is to stay curious and interested. He's doing that well. He's about my age, and I'm, I tell you, I would never go back to be 21 or 22 again. No, and no, I fondly remember being 57 a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but so Sylvan's interested in psychology. Okay, what, what door might that open for him? Well, you know, uh, music is about creating emotional responses in people. Psychology is about studying the emotional responses in people. So I think you just keep leaning into that curiosity. What is it about people that he finds interesting? Right. Uh, you know, again, because you study psychology doesn't necessarily mean you become a psychologist oh, or go a, be a therapist. counselor. Yeah, no, no, not at all. You could use that plus the in, mm -hmm. your interest in music to discover new ways of teaching creativity, to discover new ways of engaging people in creative acts. The act of creating music is, is probably one of the most creative things I could imagine doing. One of the things you can do is when you've got a new idea and you're looking for a change, you don't know where to look, you start, you start where you are. Mm -hmm. So if I've been a musician, I've been creating music, I've been playing, I've been performing, I know that aspect of the business. And now I'm becoming more psychologically articulate. I'm being clear about people's experience of their emotions and what have you. If I go back through the music industry that I know pretty well, gee, where are roles, where are activities that people are involved in where that kind of insight, that kind of informed empathy about the human experience actually becomes part and parcel of the work they do. People who are in, you know, maybe music distribution or marketing or people who are doing event management and putting on music of, I mean, where the, go meet those people, talk to them a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Who knows where that's gonna lead, but you just start leaning in to the new question you've got, to the closest community of people around you that are involved in the world, accessing the stuff that's now on your mind and see where it takes you. Yeah, well, I think we've also met a lot of people around, you know, of a certain age, around this age, who are mm -hmm. sort of moving from a first career to what people now call an encore career. Right. They're moving from the money-making part of their life mm -hmm. to what they call the meaning-making part. So if... Though probably if, for Daniel as a musician, unless he's a superstar, he's still, still got to make a living. Yeah, but if, 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 um, if that's the direction that you're going, then you really want to pay attention to what is, makes your life more meaningful, more coherent. Right. And those are the mm -hmm. kinds of questions you can go out and talk mm -hmm. to people about. It turns out on this encore career, that we actually talk to even both our students and these midlife people we encounter on a frequent basis, that if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to have not just a lot of jobs, but even multiple careers, like right. totally different reality. And I'm on my fourth career, you're on your third career. Mm -hmm. um, um, does that affect the way you're thinking today? And the truth is, certainly for young people today, I mean, they're going to live to be 100, they're going to work for 80 years. You know, you're going to have multiple careers. I mean, it's okay. You're going to have more than one shot at this thing. And for people in middle, you know, a bunch of boomers are reinventing themselves right now. Uh, usually the best place to start is what did you notice that you're already doing that you could grow into a new thing? Or who's that person you used to be that you left behind? And do you want to bring her back out of the freezer? Yeah. And give her another shot. I mean, maybe there was, maybe there was that latent entrepreneur, that business guy mm -hmm. that Daniel left behind to, to feed his artistic self. Right. So Samjin, Samjin asks us the question, you know, um, should, I, should I go out and get started as a mechanical engineer or should I, should I stay and get a master's? Right. Um, you know, there's an old expression in, the, uh, in education, in your undergraduate years, we teach you to answer hard questions. In your graduate years, we teach you to ask them. Right. I don't think you can ask good questions as a graduate student until you've worked a little bit. So I have a strong bias. I, I advise all of my mm -hmm. students, go out in the world. That's, mm -hmm. where, that's where your practice of your, of your education will occur and that's where you'll discover 
what resonates with you. Right. You know? When you start working, you not only work, by the way, in, you, in the thing you got hired to do, right. you work with people who are doing marketing and sales and business and all these other things. You get to see how all the roles in an enterprise interact. Right. And often um, that's just tremendous amount of data for you to then figure out, okay, for graduate mm -hmm. school, I want to go back and learn more about this. And it, it's often not the same thing that you did in undergraduate school. Right. So I highly advise yeah. getting out in the world and having some experience before you decide to come back to graduate school. What do school. I want to learn? Yeah, and what I want yeah. to learn. Now you got to know, we have a strong bias here. And again, it, when, you're, when you're getting advice, or we're giving advice, you got to know the bias of the people you're talking to. Between us, we got, what, 65 years of, of practical marketing and business experience. I mean, we're practical guys. Um, and so almost any time we hear somebody on the fence about should I go do it or study it, we go with do it. Do it. Yeah. You know, and very few of the people we give that advice to came back and told us that that was a bad idea. So we, we like our advice. We think that that's true. But I do want to point out this thing about grad studies in general and two points I want to make. What's a graduate degree for and the difference between a master's degree and a PhD? Because I see a lot of PhD students who don't get it. So thing one, what's graduate study for. I think it's four things you get out of a graduate degree. You get expertise, stuff you didn't know. Right. You get a network. You meet a bunch of people in your field. You get a pivot. I used to be a teacher, now I'm a marketing person. You know, particularly people who go back to grad school. And I get a sticker. I have a master's degree. I have an MBA. I have a PhD. You know, so those are very valuable things. And yeah. the portfolio of worth to you is quite different. And most people talk about graduate degrees like it's all about the expertise. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, the MBA is 80% about the network and the brand. Um, so know what you're buying. My first counsel is, if you're going to buy a graduate degree, know what you're buying. Is it worth the time and the money? Yeah. You know, and most, a lot of graduate students, it, what it's really about is a delaying action because I'm scared to death of the next thing. Well, they offered me a master's degree and that's better, is it's better to be a master's student. I'll get $10,000 more when I start. Look, you're just ducking it, okay? Get out there, get going. Um, if they're going to give it to you for free and it's only a one year program, well, maybe. Right. PhD, totally different thing. The clear thing is bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, it's a totally different animal. Yeah. It's not a bachelor's degree on steroids. It's a completely different thing. I won't try to explain it here. If you're not quite sure what a PhD is, please go talk to some before you sign up. Yeah. So Siddharth asks the question about, well, gee, what about artificial intelligence? Is that a good field? Should I go into artificial intelligence? You know, we don't have any predictive abilities to tell you what uh, you know, a great career is for you as an individual. But there are things that are growing. Right. and fields that are emerging and evolving and look like they're going to be exciting. Right. You know, I'm a professor in mechanical engineering, but I tell my students don't do mechanical engineering because it's kind of a dead field. Right. But where mechanics and biology intersect, mm -hmm. where mechanics and artificial intelligence intersect mm -hmm. and robotics and things like that, those mm -hmm. will be things that 10 or 15 mm -hmm. or 20 years out will be awesome careers. Hey, if 15 years ago you had said, I think there's something going on with the internet and social networks, and you'd specialize in that. About. I don't even know what you're talking right. about. Right. Yeah. You could have. You could have. Yeah. You know. You could be but at Facebook today. But where change today. is occurring, yeah. where growth is occurring, what's interesting about that is you're in organizations or in places where things are happening, yeah. and they're happening brand new, which means there is no such thing as the expert. There's no such thing as the perfect person. Right. What you want to do is get into those places and they go, hey, we need somebody to do. Oh, hey, Bill, you're here. You did a good thing right. on that last project. Would you go figure out what our social right. media, go right. figure that out for us. And so when if you're in a growing place, there's much more of that going on than a static place. Right, and as the enterprise is growing, there's more managers being created, more vice presidents being created, more opportunities yeah. all, yeah. all over the place. These are not good or bad or, or right or wrong, but there, there is more happening in big data than there is in print journalism right now. Right. So if you, if you love print journalism, okay, but you know you're in a shrinking zone and there are consequences related to this. So just know what you're doing. So Alan asked the question, you know, I'm so deep into my career at this point, you know, my mid 40s, almost 50, is it too late to change? Um, and, and embedded in this question is, I really hate my job. Yeah, you know, almost like the world won't let, I've, I've been so good at this thing, they won't let me go. Right, right. You know, um, well, we have a colleague here, uh, you know, uh, Dean Julie, a wonderful woman uh, who is at Stanford for 14 years because she was an unhappy lawyer. Right. And she was uh, in the law being very successful, uh, but the fact is she kind of hated it. And she was too good at it in some very important firms doing some very, very big visible stuff. And she was driving down El Camino Real, passing Stanford, you know, and just, and just looked up and saw the buildings, as I recall the story, and said, I was so much happier when I was there. Right. 
And then she, the, the key thing was she confessed to herself that she was unhappy. She remembered a time when she'd been happier and said, I, gotta, I don't know what it is, but I want to find some way to get from where I am in this law practice right. back on that campus in, in, at Stanford and in higher education. Right. And how long? I think it took her eight years. It took yeah. a year. But step one, you got to accept the truth about yourself. Yeah. So we have all of our students write two things, a work view and a world view. Right. What do you think work is for? And how does that connect to why you're here? And it takes a lot of courage not to sell out those two, mm -hmm. two ideas about yourself. And what happened with Dean Julie was she realized she was deeply unhappy, mm -hmm. highly competent, and deeply mm -hmm. unhappy at one profession that she had invested a lot of time and energy in becoming right. excellent at. But she had the courage to say, I'm not going to do that anymore, right. except that there was something else she needed. Follow her, the, follow the only clue she had, which was, this makes me happy, that doesn't. Right. But she had no definition of what this was yet. Right. So she starts, of course, she knows some people from Stanford. You know, she lives nearby. And so she starts talking to everybody she knows she, at Stanford. What do you do? Information What's it like? What's going everything. on? Right. She didn't even know she didn't know how the academy was organized. That took quite some time. And then she inadvertently followed a piece of advice that another of our colleagues, Tina Selig, who's um, in the MSNE department and also does a lot of work at the D School, and Tina's idea, who has a PhD in neuroscience, so of course she's the entrepreneurship creativity teacher here, um, her idea is just get in the door. And in all these conversations Julie was having with Stanford, she bumped, again, because she's talking to law school people, she's a lawyer, and someone went on maternity leave, I think in an administrative, entry-level administrative role right. in the law school, and she said, I'll cover for it. And uh, she'd made a good enough friend out of somebody in the law school who would put up with the fact that she was massively overqualified right. and said, well, okay. I mean, I don't know where this, there's only a nine month job, it's only a one year job, you right. know, then we have to let you go. And she said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So it's just take the first step. And then she did that. Mm -hmm. And you remember how the story goes then? <laughs> Well, I, I do. No. As it turns out, I do. So, and, and what happened was she, she did this job, she, you know, and, and she loved just being here. It really affirmed being on the campus. The task was interesting enough. And in the process, you know, she heard about another role that was opening up just about the time the one she was in ended, working as a staffer in the president's office. Right. And then she did that, and, and she worked in that role in the president's office, during which time she identified a problem that the university had which was somebody's got to be watching out for freshmen right. solely. And she invented the role of dean of freshmen, right. which is now a regular job here that she occupied as the first person ever and got to do it for 14 years. So, so what does Julie's story tell us? Well, I think there's three design principles in her story. One is accept, this notion we keep coming back to. You know, it was very yeah. difficult to accept that maybe yeah. all this investment in, in law school and yeah. law and becoming, you know, mm -hmm. a partner in a firm uh, wasn't going to make her happy. Yeah, it takes and, and a yeah, lot you, of courage. You, you really can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. Right. It's really easy to go, oh man, if I give up my law practice, you know, you just be in that agony for years as yeah. I was expecting. It's okay. I don't know how to do this, but I got to get out of the law. Right. Then a bias to action. Right. Yep. Get get involved in something that gets me closer to the, the ultimate goal of what I want, and while I'm doing that, be really, really aware and discerning. Right. Curious about what is going on around me, and mm -hmm. then the notion that. 8% of the jobs are never listed. They're not there. The job of Dean of Freshman didn't exist. Didn't exist. She invented it. Yep. And we find over and over and over again that people who do end up in a position where they say, I am actually passionate about the work I do, right. invented the job that they have. And that's a design mm -hmm. process. That's not applying right. through the internet you know, with a resume. Right. Hey, look, it's been great to talk with you guys, and, and what we're really pleased by is if you're showing up on this thing and hanging out, that means you're asking the question. You're taking some responsibility. You're looking for ideas and answers, and, you know, trust yourself. You're, you are the expert on you. Your life is really worthwhile. Do not take no for an answer. Don't take settling for a result. You know, if you don't like what we have to say, go find somebody who's got a better idea, but whatever you do, go for it. Stanford University.